During the week, uh, Eddie's been mentioning angels, and we've all had the experience, haven't we? Well, today I received my sight due to an angel, a few angels. <laughs> Over there on the right hand side is um, two pieces of the former pair of glasses. Oh. <laughs> oh, two, what do they call them? Um, two monocles. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't balance real well. And uh, so, yeah, we were doing a trip today, we were drive, and I have received my sight. <laughs> so praise God for the angels. Thanks, brothers. It was all good. And <laughs> picked up again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's an advertising for Big W. Thank you. Well, this afternoon, um, this evening, it's uh, my turn to, to do my second presentation. Last week we sort of looked at the tabernacles in the Old Testament. And uh, this evening uh, we're going to look at the um, Feast of Tabernacles in the New Testament, um, which is sort of... Surprising, because when you think about it, you go, where in the world is it in the New Testament? But as we do a bit of a, a bit of a look around, um, we'll find there's a bit of very interesting information regarding the tabernacles. Uh, one of the reasons that the, you know, the vast majority of Christians have just thrown out not only tabernacles but all the feasts is the apparent lack of evidence um, after the time of Jesus. But you don't just throw out everything because there's an apparent lack of evidence. Uh, what you do is you study the scriptures and, and you look at what uh, allusions are there, what implications are there, what scriptural evidence is there to say that something was actually done away with. And during the course of the week, um, we've heard some beautiful uh, sermons on the covenants, etc., that show us that there's just no, no way, no way God gave and did away with something that is so precious and it's his source of blessing. So um, we come here with a mindset ready to uh, receive the blessings this week. And tonight we come together to, uh, once again, go a little bit deeper into the scriptures. Um, again, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of explicit mention of the uh, piece of tabernacles in the New Testament. There's actually only one mention of it. And uh, we find that in John chapter 7. And verse 2. Mm -hmm. 
And th this isn't going to be a study on John 7 too. Um, that would take us about two months, according to our Wednesday night speed, wouldn't it? <laughs> We've looked at this uh, quite comprehensively in our study group. But uh, John 7 verse 2 simply says, Craig, Now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. That's it. That is the, 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 the Jews' Feast of the Tabernacles. Interesting that mention that. And a lot of people would jump straight on top of that and go, see, it was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. Well, who else did God give it to? You know, who was writing it? Who, who was writing it? But, but a Jew, you know? Who was it all about on that particular occasion? You know, John was writing about Jesus. The, the whole chapter is the context of Jesus. And uh, so it's not so surprising. I mean, who, who were the only people, basically, at that stage that were worshipping the true God? The Jews. The Jews were the custodians. They were the custodians. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. They weren't the only ones it was intended for because again and again and again in the Old Testament we, we read scriptures that talk about when the strangers within your gates. You know, anybody that joined themselves you know, into the community of Israel was supposed to join Israel. Um, so yes, it wasn't specifically or only for them. Um, but yeah. So the Jews feast of the tabernacles was at hand. Uh, the context of, of this chapter is of course uh, Jesus' life and uh, him actually going up eventually to uh, the tabernacles, having said to his brothers, well, I'm not going, um, but of course he did. And when he went up, <clears throat> there's two passages uh, which sort of stick out in our minds, John 7, verse 37 and 38, where Jesus uh, said that he was the living water, and also as we move over into John chapter 8, he said that I am the light of the world. In, in verse 12. Uh, and, and the depth of those statements um, goes way back, of course, into the Old Testament because Jesus drew on that. They were types, weren't they? The poor pointed forward to him. He was the fulfillment of all these things. Although the feast is only mentioned once in the New Testament by name, uh, the frequent use of the themes of the feast uh, shows that the feasts played a significant role, or they played a significant role, in the nature and mission of Christ from its inauguration, beginning of Christ's life, right through to the end of the Bible in Revelation when it's uh, consummated in heaven with God when we dwell together there. And so the Gospels and the book of Revelation, when you put it all together, actually gives us a whole panorama of uh, Christ completing his work for us, and, and the Feast of Tabernacles flows through all of that. And there's three perspectives that we can look at. Um, we won't look at all of those perspectives in detail tonight, but the first one was the Christological aspect, that is the way that the Feast was expressed in the Gospels uh, in the life of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came and dwelt among men. You know, we've focused a lot on the dwelling, the dwelt word, um, during the week. And uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. Secondly, there's the eschatological aspect, which is the way the feast is expressed in the consummation of redemption. That is when it's finally all come to an end. And, uh, of course, the end for this world and the system of things is, a, is the beginning of eternity, isn't it? Amen? So, uh, although there's a certain aspect that it's an end, but really, it's a beginning. We know, Isaiah 66, I was to say, from one new moon to the next, from one Sabbath to the next, so we know that there's going to be a continuation into eternity. Um, all people, all nations, shall come to meet before the Lord. And of course, this is when we shall be taken to our heavenly home and dwell with the Father. So in the Christological aspect, Christ comes and dwells amongst us. In the eschatological aspect, we go and finally dwell with the Father. That's mentioned in Revelation. Thirdly, the existential aspect, that is the way we um, live and observe the feast, here and now. Okay? So we'll just look at the Christological aspect. For now, and we'll start off with the incarnation. 
John, in introducing the nature and mission of Christ, uses the metaphor of the booth of the Feast of the Tabernacles. We'll go to John 1 and uh, verses 1 and verse 14. So we know that Christ came into the world um, as the Redeemer, and of, of course to be the Restorer, to restore the relationship between God and humanity. And in this verse, in verse 14, it says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt. Now, to a casual English reader, we look at the word dwelt, and said, oh yeah, it's, it's sort of like he came to hang out, he just came to be here, it just was where he was. But when we look at the... Uh, at the Greek, the word for dwelt has a bit of significance. Um, it's the word skinu, uh, for lack of a better pronunciation, we'll go with skinu. And, and that means to, to tent or to encamp, uh, that is figuratively to occupy, even as in a mansion, or specifically to reside. Um, as God did in the tabernacle of old, when God <laughs> resided, um, so there he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Same word, dwell, but in the Hebrew. He wanted to tabernacle among them. Um, and it also has a, a meaning of uh, protection and communion. So we've got to remember that as well, the protection and the communion. Last Sunday night we looked at God being, he provided and protected during the journey of the Jews through the wilderness. All right? And so if we transfer that across to Jesus, there's a lot more significance than, oh yeah, he just came to dwell. He came to protect. He came to provide in a certain manner. He was called the good shepherd. And what else did the good shepherd do but protect and provide for his sheep? Lay down his life. Lay down his life as well. Um, also comes from, yeah, the, the noun, um, eskinos. Uh, and that is the actual hut or temporary residence itself. Uh, and figuratively, the human body. We remember the scripture that says, uh, a body hast thou provided for me. Um, actually, that's Hebrew, Hebrews 10.5. Maybe we can look at that. Hebrews 10 verse 5. Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Very familiar to us this week. Second Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto him unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation ok so God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So when Christ came to this earth to dwell, when the Word came to dwell amongst us, um, the Father came and dwelt also with Christ. You see, Christ just didn't come you know, alone. There's many times where Jesus said, I am not alone, for the Father is with me. 
You see, and so this, this was a team effort. The, the Father and the Son have always worked together. The Father has never wanted to be separate from us. But our sins had separated. So Christ, through the incarnation, became a man. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us because we can stand in the presence of a man. But we cannot stand in the presence of the Almighty God and live. So God provided a, a vessel, a means, a channel through which he could come as close as possible to us and dwell among us. Which was, is, and shall always be his desire. That's the significance. Just as God drew close to Israel in the wilderness by having them build a tabernacle for him to dwell in, and just as he instructed Israel to build small booths, for themselves to dwell in at the Feast of Tabernacles, so to God did prepare a dwelling place in the human body of his son, so that he could draw near to his people. And especially at this time, you know, the world was in darkness and gross darkness was upon the people. We've looked at that scripture as well this week. Um, when Rome was in control, and, and it was a dark time for God's people. Um, but at that time, there was a great light that was about to shine in the incarnation. The temp temporary structures of tree branches in which the children of Israel dwelt at the time of the feast provided an appropriate symbol of the temporary tabernacle of sinful human flesh in which Jesus dwelt in while working out our salvation. Uh, this thought at the beginning of the Gospel of John paved the way for the latter references, that is, Christ came to dwell or to tabernacle among us. And of course, in John chapter 7, we, we get an amplification of that when he's at the Feast of Tabernacles. In Matthew's Gospel, um, he also alludes to the dwelling of God with his people at the time of Jesus' birth by quoting from Isaiah 7.14. But we'll go to Matthew 1.23 um, for the actual quote. Matthew 1.23. Whoever gets it first, just okay. read it. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Is that what you're Yep, saying? yep, exactly. God with us. So Jesus' name, or this child's name, would be Emmanuel, um, interpreted, God with us. So again, we have a, a, a picture of God wanting to come and dwell, and he did that in, in Christ. Um, and I believe that the Father was in His Son right from the beginning. I know He had a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit at His baptism, but I believe that Christ, uh, the Father, was in His Son right from the beginning. It's confirmed in John 14, 23. anybody else, if you've got any thoughts during the presentation, do throw them forward. This is like a Sabbath school class in, in a sense. Jesus answered and said to him, If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him and make our abode with him. Again, we see this partnership. We will come. The Father, our abode. Amen. So we can see that the incarnation of Christ was announced in the language and meaning of the feast, the dwelling, the, 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 the booth, the tabernacle, in the language and meaning of the feast. But his life also developed in the symbols and settings of the feast. During the feast of the uh, feast, the Jews would often sing psalms, I think they call it the Hallel. Um, from Psalm 113 through to 118, and they'd seen different parts of those uh, psalms at different parts of the tabernacle ceremonies. Okay, now uh, one of them was uh, Psalm 118:27, where it says, "God is the Lord." Actually, no, I'll go back to one verse. Uh, Psalm 118, verse 26. 
said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who, who in the Jews' minds was this pointing forward to? Messiah. The Messiah. Exactly. They were looking forward to the Messiah. So every time they sung this song, it was to remind them of the Messiah to come. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of, our, of the Lord. And verse 27, God is the Lord which has showed us light. So in the context of the Messiah coming, God was to show light. And that harmonizes beautifully with that scripture we just mentioned before. Uh, darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people, but the glory of the Lord was risen upon you. And the praise part of those verses is verse 28 and 29. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. My God, I will exalt thee. I give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. So one of the main hymns that they sang, one of the main praises they sang at the Feast of Tabernacles was about God's <coughs> mercy endures forever. Of course it will. Now, that was the incarnation. So you can see that although it's not specifically mentioning the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a lot of allusion to tabernacles, the dwelling of God with men, that God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Now, <clears throat> the date of Christ's birth is also a, an interesting one. Uh, when was Christ born? Christ we know that in this world, I mean, it's already, I mean, Easter hardly passes these days, and you've got <clears throat> Christmas decorations in the shops, eh? I mean, it's just a, a rolling on of one into the other into the other. I guess it's only dispersed these days by Halloween. It sort of interrupts them, but... Yeah. <laughs> Any reasonable student of the Bible and history will know that Jesus was not born on December 25. And it was simply adopted... January 6th, yeah. all that other day <laughs> held, held by the, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll see. But it was simply adopted, wasn't it? It's it, it, it an amalgamation of Rome and the pagan nations, you know, the pagan customs, etc. It was amalgamated. So let, let's do a little bit of sort of backwards calculation. And if we start um, from the Passover time, when Jesus, when Jesus uh, was crucified, what year was it crucified? So it's 31? Yeah. Yeah, you baptized in 27, crucified. Was it 30 or 31? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Part way through 30. Yeah. Part way through 30. Honestly. Yep. Okay. And what time of year was it we just mentioned? Passover. It was the Passover. Yeah. Which is, yeah, and that was the spring. Now, when was his baptism? 27. It was 27, and it was how many years? Three and a half. So if we go three and a half years back from the spring, what's six months earlier than spring? Fall, autumn. Okay, and was there any particular... Oh, actually, we just looked at the, the birth and the incarnation. Um, or, well, it would have been tabernacles time anyway, three and a half. Okay? So, fascinating that Jesus' birth... Oh, actually, no, we're going back to the... the, the I think we're self confused here. The baptism. Yeah, the baptism. Was that correct? We just... That's why I did 31. Yeah, we said 31. I mean, correct one way or the other. I thought it was 31 because then you add yeah. three and a half to 30 to, to 30 and a half, so it's the 31st year. Yeah, it brings you to 34. So it's 30, 31. Okay. My, my point though was the Passover, not the date. Yeah. 
All right, so three and a half years before Passover is Tabernacles. Now there's a verse, um, Luke 3.23. Luke 3.23. It's, it's interesting the way that Luke actually wrote this sentence. Yeah. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just above that in verse 21, 22, what was the occasion? Now the people. It was, his, it was his baptism. It was his baptism. And so here, and it said, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Right? Interesting language. He began to be about 30 years of age. When do you begin to be your new age? <laughs> Oh, on your birthday. Your birthday. On your birthday, you begin to be your next, you know, you, you, you click over the numbers. Unfortunately, you click over the numbers. But, so it says, and he began to be 30. Now, just, I mean, this is just in what I've been reading, and I'm just bringing you, you know, some of the things that I've read. So if you go back from the tabernacles, if that was when he began to be 30, and you just go back, and I'm not worried about what year or whatever, my point is, is it possible exactly, because if that was his birth date and his yeah, baptism, and you go back 30 years, and it just could have been possible that it, his, his birth was at Tabernacle's time. And he came, let's call him Emmanuel, God with us. The Word was made flesh, and Tabernacle, Skinud, dwelt with us from the time of a child, because he just didn't start tabernacling up here at his baptism, he started tabernacling as a child with his family and then grew up with the children. So anyway, it's just an interesting concept. I mean, praise God, we don't know when the birth date was, otherwise people would glorify that day as well, wouldn't they? <laughs> 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 I heard Richard Davidson one day talking about this, and I wish I could remember the details, mm -hmm. but he, he was able to pinpoint the <coughs> month that Mary visited Elizabeth when the, when John had oh, okay. a child yes. left within him, mm -hmm. and she was pregnant at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think he said it was around the September October period that he would have been born, which fits perfectly mm -hmm. with the fact. Yeah, Miss Lazar's college professor back when she was studying Bible in Croatia um, said, probably on your birthday, Zlata, which was October 14. So, so it's in that window, because we know that the, the tabernacles can be between September and October. We, we know that. Um, but anyway, he, he just said that. You know, could have been October 14. It's like his birthday. So I just thought it was a fascinating little bit of calculation looking at the scriptures, whether it is or not. That's... It's interesting also, it's not relevant, but yeah. John the Baptist, I think, was six months older. Six months, yeah. six months older. Yeah, Passover. which would have meant he was born about Passover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been... And isn't that fascinating? Which feast comes first? Passover. And which feast comes second? Mm -hmm. Who was born first and who was born second? Mm -hmm. Is there any significance? I don't know. It's just fascinating to sort of look. It wouldn't yeah. have been, he wouldn't have had many children his own age because Herod killed them all. So I'm just wondering if John was the only one that escaped it, I mean... Everyone under two was killed. Mm -hmm. I was wondering Bethlehem. if he had any people his age. In Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. Yeah. Yeah. John might not have been. He wasn't in Bethlehem. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and, and, the, and this point. The fact... The fact that there was no room in the inn, and this was, this was mentioned recently, which is good. There's, uh, the fact that there was no room in the inn at that time, and not only because the Roman census was at that time, but because um, the tabernacles was on at that time, and it was one of the three feasts where all the Jews came together um, and were expected to attend at Jerusalem, and Bethlehem, being where Joseph and Mary had to attend for the census, was only four miles from Jerusalem, so it was in pretty close proximity anyway. Um, and so just, just all of these circumstances together sort of lean towards that, that Jesus may have been born 
at Tabernacles. According to um, this gentleman, Barney Kazdan, a uh, historian, the Romans were known to take their censuses according to the prevailing custom of the occupied territories. Hence, in the case of Israel, they would opt to have the people report to their province at the time, which was convenient uh, for them. Uh, there's no apparent logic for calling a census like December 25 in the middle of winter, because who knows what the conditions would have been like in the middle of winter, whether people could have gotten there um, in, in, in Palestine. If you were out on the hills, as a shepherd, you'd freeze. You'd freeze, yeah, you'd freeze in the middle of winter, yeah. Um, hmm. We've noticed, or we would have noticed through, through history, that often God coincides very important dates, or events, sorry, with the feasts. Okay, and I'll just run through a couple of them. Uh, we earlier learned, you know, starting with Abraham coming out of Ur of the Chaldees, um, doing some backtracking from Israel when they came out of Egypt, they came out on what day? What feast began then? And it was the self same day. We've looked at that, haven't we? Same, self, same day as Abraham. So Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees at Passover time. Israel came out of Egypt at Passover time. Um, Jesus died on the cross at Passover time, according to the plan of salvation. Christ arose from the grave at the time of the waving of the sheep of the, the barley as the first fruits of the coming harvest. Uh, the outpouring of the first fruits of God's Holy Spirit took place when the day of Pentecost, the, the, the Feast of Weeks, was fully come. Uh, we know that the investigative judgment, as Adventists, we believe that the Adventists. Uh, the investigative judgment began on October 22, 1844, which happened to be the Day of Atonement. So is it possible that, that, that this big event, and I think it was a big event, Christ's birth, is it possible that this event may well have been on a, on a feast day? God seems to be pretty, pretty good when it comes to this kind of thing, and he's very specific. He doesn't want us to miss these um, occasions. Now, another interesting point is found in the narrative of Luke regarding the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 2 and verse 7 to 10. And she brought forth her, forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And they were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you... Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to the Jews. All people. Oh, to all people. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Okay. So it's good tidings of great joy for all people. The Feast of Tabernacles was known as the season of our joy and the Feast of the Nations. The season of our joy was related to the fact that the people rejoiced in the fact that God historically had given them protection and provided a great harvest for another year. And also, um, it reflected on their uh, protection by God during their, their long journey through the wilderness. In giving His only begotten Son, God was offering them the protection of the Good Shepherd and also supplying all of their needs through Christ Jesus. Our greatest need? Redemption and restoration, salvation. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus, well, let me re-emphasize that. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. And so truly, this was good tidings of great joy for all people. So it again ties into the language of tabernacles. So it was fitting that the angel should announce the birth of Jesus at the time of tabernacles with those words. I bring you good tidings of great joy, and they shall be for all people. Interestingly also, Zechariah prophesied, prophesied of such an event, Zechariah 14 and verse 16, where he says, It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Interesting. And another interesting point is uh, related to the star that will come out of Jacob. Numbers 24 and verse 17. It says, I shall see him, but not now. Actually, let's go back to the verse before. He said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near or nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Who's this referring to? In his role as? As the Messiah. See, so the star of Jacob was to be the Messiah. The people dwelling in booths made of leafy branches, and, and this again is just what I've um, discovered in my reading. The people dwelling in booths made of leafy branches at the time of the feast, according to the historians, constructed them in such a manner so that their view uh, of the sky was unobstructed. This would allow them to see the stars at night. It's one of these cultural things, one of these traditional things, not just to have the, the, the booth made, but to have it so that they could look up at the stars and perhaps see the star of Jacob. That's the traditional view. You know, one of the little stories that came through. Um, so it was a special season of stargazing tied wonderfully uh, to the messianic hope of the star coming out of Jacob. It may well have been this hope which inspired the wise men of the East. So it must have been at the end of Tabernacles, because at the beginning of Tabernacles, you've got a full moon. Yep. So it would be, because you know, now you can go outside if the lights are on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I sort of wondered which part of Tabernacles it would have been. But yeah. <coughs> Either that or um, if he was born on the first day of Tabernacles, he would have been circumcised on the last. Mm. On the eighth day. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, I can't answer. Who can? Who can? <laughs> yeah, who can? Could, but could the circumcision be done on the Sabbath? Yes. Yeah, they would. Oh, they would? Well, yes. He's a baby. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Born on the Sabbath. Um, all right, I won't go into any more detail into that. I'm just going to keep my up and by the clock. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just interesting that uh, all these things relating to his birth um, sort of show us that it could well have been in the time of the tabernacles. Now let's move on to the transfiguration. Now, as I was studying and reading it, I, was, I just had this mindset that, oh, this sort of, it's proving that Jesus was um, transfigured at tabernacles. And then after rereading it all, I thought, oh, did I misunderstand the plot? What um, was being described, and when I say what I was reading, again I was going through the God's Festivals book uh, from Sam Bakayoki, what they're actually saying is the, the illusions, the, the symbolism um, at that time uh, alluded to the tabernacles, just showing how these things flowed through Christ, Christ's life, not that specifically this time was the Feast of Tabernacles. So just clarify that before I go further. <clears throat> And so my notes, I'm just going to have to juggle my notes because I've misrepresented my notes in what I'd already prepared. And then as I was reading it, 
early out and like, oh, I think I've made a mistake. Okay? So, so bear with me as I try and juggle these notes. There's no specific mention, of course, of the Feast of Tabernacles in the narrative of the Transfiguration, but there are several explicit allusions which lend weight, um, well, which just, yeah, lend to the, the meaning of Tabernacles in and through Christ's life. Um, the first possible connection between the Feast of Tabernacles and the Transfiguration is in the chron uh, chronology, or in the chronological detail, given in the beginning of the narrative. Now, the three Gospel writers who record this event all begin with similar language. In Matthew 17.1, Matthew 9.2, they both state that after six days... Okay, I might, might actually look at one of them just to see, see exactly what was being said. Matthew 17.1. Yeah, if you've already got it, that'd be great. After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And verse 2. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his rain and his light as the light. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it says, after six days. Um, interesting why he would use the six days specifically. Of course, Mark also use the same terminology, but in Luke 9 verse 28, what's the significance of the sixth day? We'll just read this one and then I'll mention it. Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's like, why did they both mention six? And now here, what does Luke mention? Uh, Luke 9 28. And it, Eight days after they said that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Yeah, so, so he says after eight days, after um, what had just happened, he feeds 5,000 and he said to them, if any man will come after me. So, like, okay, eight days after he feeds 5,000. Mm -hmm. Alright, so back in the other ones, it was six days after the events that were taking place, Matthew 17, if we go before that, the Lord predicts his death, mm, six days after that. So as I, as I was looking for it, I'm like, I couldn't see anything specific, but what this historian and, and the guy that he quoted was Jean Danielu or something, it's a, a Romanian name. The point he was bringing out was on the Feast of Tabernacles, you have your first Sabbath, and then there's six days in between, and then you have your final Sabbath. So, um, all of it together is eight days. But if you exclude the two Sabbaths on the end, you've got six days in the middle. And maybe they're just playing with numbers, but that's sort of the significance that was brought out. I'm just showing you or sharing what I read. Fascinating. The illusion here was that an event where the interval of six to eight days had special significance. Tabernacles was one occasion. According to Leviticus 23, the first of all, as I just mentioned, yeah, they were holy convocations, the gathering together of the people, and the gap between those was six days. The second possible connection was Peter's reaction. Okay, so connecting the tabernacles with transfiguration. The second possible connection was Peter's reaction at the brilliant appearance of Christ and the presence of Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration. Peter's immediate reaction was, Mark 9 and verse 5. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Mm -hmm. So, when we just read that, oh yeah, let us build three, make three tabernacles. Word Yeah, and we just go, oh yeah, that's fine, we'll make three tabernacles. But the word is that little hut. In the Greek, it was that little hut, that little tabernacle, that little, that little booth. I mean, they were up. Where were they exactly for the transfer? They... Let's try and catch it. Yeah, 
Where, where did they go for the transfiguration? They went up into a high mountain. So what was he going to build? A tabernacle with. Right. You know, a hut up there high on the mountain. Right. Branches. Which is exactly what the Jews used back in the old days. So again, these are just illusions and symbols related to... And remembering, what were the Jews looking for? The star of Jacob, the Messiah. And so Peter's getting all excited. Moses is here. Elijah must be the Messiah. Let's build the huts. You know, let's tabernacle. How about we just tabernacle here for a while and then just enjoy the moment? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to just enjoy the moment? Yeah. And, and Peter being so enthusiastic as he was and spontaneous, it's like, yes, let's build some tabernacles, some little huts. Mm. So it says in verse 2, after six days. Hmm, yeah. Peter's expression, it's good for us to be here, seems to re um, reflect his belief that the rest, because it tied to the Messiah, was the rest, the anapausis, that, that the Jews were going to have when the Messiah came. They believed, oh, the enemies will be defeated, we'll finally enter our rest, we'll live happily ever after. <clears throat> and, and so he's like, oh, this is good, the Messiah is here, let's build the hearts, we're going to tabernacle, we're going to enter into our rest. Okay? Another connection to the feast is the use of the metaphors in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2 and verse 5. So we have two interesting things here. One, Jesus' face shining bright as the sun. Do you remember in the Old Testament something like that happened? Moses. With, with Moses? Okay, wasn't there a prophecy pointing to a prophet like him would come? Okay, and who would he have been? He would have been the Messiah. And, uh, and also there was something else in the days of Israel that went over the top of Israel as they travelled and journeyed. A cloud. A bright cloud. And so in verse 2, we have that Jesus' face shone as the sun, his raiment was like white, uh, white as light. And in verse 5, a bright cloud overshadowed them. You think the Father was drawing near again in a special sense? And then he spoke, This is my beloved Son. All right? Everything is telling Peter, This is it. The Messiah is here, we're tabernacling. You know, so we see the significance. If not the time of the tabernacles, at least it was just, yeah, everything from his experience and his life and everything that he'd read of the scriptures was telling him, I'm tabernacling, I'm tabernacling with the Messiah. Let's build tabernacles and celebrate this. Also, the fact that Elijah and Moses were there were also very significant. Elijah was the one promised to return before the great and dreadful, dreadful day of the Lord when the Messiah would tabernacle with his people. And Moses, who gave the instructions to build the tabernacle that God might dwell among his people, who was the leader of the people as the cloud led them through the wilderness, was also there. So you can see all this symbolism in, in, in the transfiguration, tying to tabernacles. Amazing stuff. And it was Deuteronomy 18.8, by the way. I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I shall command him. No wonder Peter was excited. Everything that he was experiencing was a fulfillment of the meaning in the events and symbols of tabernacles. As mentioned earlier, there's no specific mention of the Feast of Tabernacles, but boy, there's a lot of allusion to it. And uh, so that was significant. And of course, the Transfiguration was only a preliminary messianic fulfillment of tabernacling with the Messiah, that the final fulfillment, the one we're looking forward to, 
is when that same Messiah returns in the clouds of glory and takes us back to heaven to be face to face, tabernacling God dwelling with us. He will be our God and we shall be his children. Amen? Amen. Beautiful. I'll just try and quickly race through this last part because there's some very interesting stuff here about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. John 12, 6 to 12. Now we know that that wasn't tabernacles because the Passover was only six or so days ahead. That's not the point. This, this is not what we're trying to bring out, that it was tabernacles time. But what we find in John 12, verse 6, this is said not that... John 12, 6 and 12, I haven't got the right reference. I don't think it is. I might have the wrong chapter. I mean, yeah. Yeah, anyway, we'll go down to 12, because it was certainly the triumphal entry. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. Remember, we just quoted the scriptures earlier. Blessed is he, uh, Psalm 118, uh, verse 25, 26. You know, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Of course, this was just before Passover. But the, the, the meaning, the illusion, the palm branches which they made their tabernacles with and, and the song that they were quoting was the song that they did at Tabernacles um, introducing the Messiah. That's the significance that I want to bring out. So it's in it right through the scriptures here. Only one mention of the word, the feast of the, the Jews' feast of Tabernacles in the New Testament, but the actual meaning of Tabernacles is flowing right through beautifully. We know that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Those famous words. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I would have gathered you together as a hen, taking the chickens under her wings, however it goes exactly. Um, he, he wanted to get them close and tabernacle with his people, but he came to his own end, his own received him not. And again, God's desire wasn't fulfilled. Wouldn't it be sad if the God who wanted to dwell so closely with his people, who, who tried to be close to them in the wilderness, tried throughout the centuries to be close to his people, and they constantly rebelled, constantly rejected him, and then finally he sends his son, God in Christ, to reconcile the world to himself, came to his own, his own rejected him not, and, and um, then Christ dies, goes back to heaven, and then the Christians that come, not immediately after that, but in the few centuries later, go, that was a feast of the Jews, we don't tabernacle with God, oh yeah, let's welcome the pagans and you know, feast with God on the pagan days. Wouldn't it be sad if that was the end of the Feast of Tabernacles in the history of the Bible? Wouldn't that be sad? And it hasn't reached its fulfillment. And wouldn't Satan be jumping up and down with joy, going, nobody's ever experienced the, the, the joy, the fullness of joy of God's Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. Huh. I won again. Well, I won finally. Not again. He finally got one over God. That no one's enjoying the blessing. Because wasn't it a blessing right through the Old Testament? It was supposed to be a blessing. The blessing of the harvest. The blessing of protection. God's provision, the blessing of the nearness of God, that God could pour out his presence upon these people and dwell in them. That's the blessing. And wouldn't it be sad if that blessing never was fulfilled? Well, he thought he had a victory, it was short lived. It's always short lived. We are tabernacling. We are tabernacling. And we never even got into John 7 and John 8. And an hour is just about up. Like I said, it took us how many months <laughs> to get through John 7 and John 8. There is always so much in every verse when you pull all the scriptures together, isn't there? And so I, I guess in a final word, rather than continuing with the notes, I want 
and I hope and pray, and I know that you will, I don't even need to hope and pray, that we will be the people that God can look down from in heaven and say, these people want my presence. They want to tabernacle with me. And so the words of Jesus, and that was John 14, 23, that you mentioned before. John 14, 23. God's always wanted to comfort his people. He's wanted to comfort. And Jesus, in the context of the comforter, said these words. He that loves me, and keeps not my son. Oh, sorry, I missed it. 23, I'm reading 24. Jesus answered and said to him, now I'm going to go back to 22. Jesus, Judas said to him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us? Who was he talking to? Jesus. He said, Jesus, how are you going to manifest yourself unto us? And Jesus answered and said to him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Whose words were Jesus' words? The words I speak are not my words, but him that, that him that sent me. He will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode. We will tabernacle with him. Brothers and sisters, we are on God's path. And God's path is the only right way. Is it Jeremiah 6.16? Another verse just popped in my head. I'm sure it's Jeremiah 6.16. Yes. Yeah, is that the one? I think it's an appropriate way to finish. Somebody. I wonder how that just popped into your head. Yeah. Maybe the Father and the Son are close by tonight. Thus, excuse me, this is the voice. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. And you shall find rest, and apposis, the rest of the Messiah, by tabernacling with him. And I don't want to read the rest of the verse, because you know what the rest of the verse says. And we don't want to be those people. Want me to read it? Maybe there's an echo of this going around the world at this time. But they said, we will not walk therein. Brothers and sisters, let's walk in the way of the Lord. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us of every sin. We've seen that wonderful fellowship with one another. Haven't we worked this week? Praise God. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, I, I thank you, Lord, for the time we spent together this evening looking at your word and how precious the time of tabernacles is to you. We've looked at the life of Jesus from his birth and pretty much right through, although there's a lot more we could have looked at. But we have seen beautiful things again tonight. And in wrapping up, Lord, you have given us a couple of wonderful scriptures to contemplate. We kneel before you, Lord, asking that you will continue to guide us in the way. We stand, we wait to see the glory of the Lord revealed in our lives, that we might shine as lights. As Jesus said, he was the light of the world. As he stood in the temple, as the lights blazed above him, Lord, we want to be that, that light in our dark world in these days. So please fill us, fill us with yourself, with your presence, and bless us as we go our um, ways this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.